took me six years from start to finish. And I remember I kept describing exactly what you're saying to my female friends, where I was yeah. like, I, I feel like I'm on the other side of the mountain. And then you look up and there's this whole other yes. <laughs> mountain still, like the top is so far. Because um, you keep thinking at every stage that you're on the other side of it, but then you're not. That's Sarah Zandia, and this is the Powerful Ladies Podcast. Hey guys, I'm your host, Kara Duffy, and this is the Powerful Ladies Podcast, where I invite my favorite humans, the awesome, the up to something, and the extraordinary to come and share their story. I hope that you'll be left entertained, inspired, and moved to take action towards living your most powerful life. Sarah is a filmmaker, writer, and director. She recently directed an episode for NBC's Good Girls and her latest film, A Simple Wedding is a multicultural romantic comedy starring Tara Grammy and Christopher O'Shea. It's hilarious. Go watch it right now. And it's available for streaming on iTunes and Amazon. On this episode, Sarah tells her journey from journalist to filmmaker, how being an Iranian American influences her storytelling, why her circle of friends, including past guest Sasha Sagan, are her bedrock, and what really happens when you decide to make your first feature film. All that and so much more coming up, but first. If you're interested in discovering what possibilities and businesses are available for you to create and to live your most fulfilling life, please visit thepowerfulladies.com forward slash coaching and sign up for a free coaching consultation with me. There is no reason to wait another day to not be living your best life when you instead could be running at full speed towards your wildest dreams today. Well, I am so excited that you are here today because you are one of our amazing, powerful lady referrals from Sasha Sagan. Yes, thank you. Of course. Um, introduce who you are and what you're up to to everyone listening. Okay. Um, my name is Sarah Zandia. I am a filmmaker. I'm a writer-director. Um, right now I, I have a feature film that was just, that is in theaters now. It's, it's wrapping up its theatrical and it's available on VOD on Amazon and iTunes. It's called A Simple Wedding and it's a culture clash romantic comedy. Ooh. Um, and I recently just directed an embassy, an episode of NBC's Good Girls, which I just wrapped up. Um, and now I'm sort of, I'm starting to write again and, and finding my next passion project. Very exciting. There is so much in there that I want to dive into. Before we dive into all the work things, how do you and Sasha know each other? Sasha and I met several, like many years ago, almost over a decade ago at the Tribeca Film Festival. We both had made short films that were in the same program. Um, and so we were, we were screening our films back to back and, um, she had written this movie called Bastard, which Kirsten Dunst had directed. And I was there with a film called The Pool Party, uh, which was a short film that I made in Iran. Um, and so we met, you know, at the premiere of, of these two works and, um, hit it off and we're fast friends ever since. And a lot of creative collaboration has come out of our friendship and mm -hmm. a lot of friend and a lot of friendships. She started this, um, female group called the Ladies Dining Society, Love which it. is like, it was a monthly female group dinner that she kind of curated and um, and we became this like tribe in New York, and we'd meet once a month mm -hmm. at this restaurant, and um, and we just like I mean I have so many good friends from that group still, um, and it was just like this amazing moment in time mm -hmm. for us, and um, so many friendships were formed from our meeting at this festival. So yeah, it was just she's such a wonderful person, and I I love her new book. It's amazing. It's so good. It's so good. Um, and so yeah, I'm super proud of her for for yeah. getting to this point. Well, and what I love about that story is it's a perfect example of how not to be in competition with people, but to collaborate and how much more comes out of it. Like you guys were in theory competing for the same thing. And now you have this friendship that's lasted a decade and other projects and people and friends. And now you're here. And it's like, 
like we put as females so much pressure to like protect, defend instead of just lean in and have fun together. Oh, for sure. I mean, it was quite the opposite. It was just like we just meeting people at your frequency, you know, Mm -hmm. you're like, oh my God, how do I spend more time with this person? How do I like, you know, because I have so many inspiring women around me and Sasha is definitely one of them. And I think we just, yeah, there's just a spark and we, Mm -hmm. and so much good can come out of collaboration and friendships and especially female friendships. They're just, they're, um, it's so special. Yeah. And, and to me, it just allows us to do what we did naturally as kids. Like it's, it gives that space of like play and collaboration and discovery, um, which we all need more of. (laughs) Yeah, we definitely need it. And I I really believe in that saying, um, the sum is greater than its parts. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I feel like, you know, when you find people, women like you, and um, it's just so, it's so nice, so much good can come from it and so much support. And it's just yeah. such a source of strength mm-hmm. to have a, a female group. Yeah, uh, 100%. When, um, do you guys met in New York? Are you from New York originally? Because you're now out in LA, right? Yes. My background is, well, I was actually born in Iran. Mm-hmm. I'm Iranian-American. Um, and then my family immigrated to the suburbs of Washington, D.C. when I was five. So I grew up in Maryland. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I went to, I lived in New York. I moved to New York to work and to pursue, you know, my education and, and yeah. to start a career in the arts. And I was in New York for almost 15 years. Um, and then I finally took the plunge and moved up to L.A. four years ago um, to, to make my film. Mm-hmm. Uh, I kind of moved out here because I it was it was getting more traction in Hollywood. And um, so, yeah, I've been it's kind of like Tehran, D.C., New York, L.A. It's a long, long journey. I've had many homes. I feel like most powerful ladies have. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Especially when you're following your passions. It's hard to. It's it's unique when you get to have everything you want where you started from. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's yeah, it's especially like I mean, being an immigrant too. It's just like you're kind of yeah, it's it's a nomadic kind of path. And being an artist, it leads you to so many different places, mm-hmm. and um, you know, you kind of go where the project is. So that gives it gives it its own like yeah. nomadic existence. Yeah, I can't I can't imagine a life that doesn't have some level of being nomadic in it. For sure, especially nowadays. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, how did you end up getting into film? Well, I always, I was always interested in people's stories, yeah. um, and I initially thought I would want to, I wanted to be a filmmaker. Mm-hmm. I mean, a, sorry, a journalist, um, because I grew up in DC, and you know, the careers that you're exposed to there are you're a journalist, you're an attorney, or you're a lobbyist. And so I was like, definitely, I'm going to be a journalist. And I have a really international background. Mm -hmm. Um, I majored in French, I speak Farsi. So we just had, you know, I thought I wanted to be like an international reporter. I knew Christine Amanpour. Yes. And she was like, (laughs) she was like, and still is kind of like an idol. Yes. Um, She's such a strong, smart woman. Um, and, uh, and our community, the Iranian community like, idolizes her, you know, where she's such a gem. Um, yeah. And being in D.C., it's just like you're you're always around reporters. Mm-hmm. Um, so I thought that's what I wanted to do. And I um, I studied journalism and I, I worked in a newsroom after college. I worked at I, like intern at CNN and, um, and VOA. And so I I. I kind of dabbled in news, um, but I was always drawn to directors. Mm -hmm. Even within the news context, you know, I was always somehow assigned to do stories about filmmakers and film and culture and arts. Mm -hmm. And I, I kind of like, there was just this law of attraction and I naturally gravitated towards um, film and filmmakers. And I was always kind of a film buff. um, And so was my family. We're super into movies. Um, And the more I met them and interviewed them, the more I was like, I think that's the way I meant to tell my stories, not through news, um, but through through narrative storytelling. Um, And I did a lot of documentary work. um, And so the shift from nonfiction to fiction was pretty easy because I was still, you know, working in news and documentary. I was still telling stories, but um, I wanted to make the leap into fiction 
Um, and I, I went to Columbia University's School of Arts and I got a, um, an MFA in film directing and writing. It's, it was in directing, but we have to write everything at that, in that program. Um, so I just got, I just went into like basically a film school and, and, and the conservatory there. It's, and I just, I made the leap. I just did it. Um, and when I told my parents, I was like, I'm going to become a, I want to become a filmmaker. Um, and they were like, oh God, (laughs) (laughs) they were like, it was bad enough. You wanted to be a journalist, but now, no, actually my mom at the time was kind of, happy that I didn't, I didn't want to keep pursuing journalism Mm because it was, it was actually when I was working in a newsroom, it was during the Iraq war. It was under George W. Yeah. It was a really dangerous time for journalists and it still is. I mean, it is a kind of dangerous profession. Um, So they were kind of relieved that um, I was going to stop doing that. (laughs) But um, so, so they were pretty supportive and and now they're like super behind it because they, they they saw my movie. They love they they lo- they love it, and mm-hmm. um, and so they're very supportive. And the pool party is the one with the scenes with the chandelier and the pumping from your um, reel. Yeah, the the pool party is um, it's yeah it's the story of uh, a domestic servant in Iran um, who is it's about his relationship with his employers mm-hmm. and like sort of his role in their family. Um, and I was in grad school. I was in, I was at Columbia at the time and I really wanted to go back to Iran because I hadn't been since I was like 13, you know, so mm-hmm. I, I hadn't been back as an adult. I was going back, back and forth a lot as a, as a kid and a, or a young teenager, but I hadn't been back as an adult. And I was like, it's, it was, I had to make a thesis film mm-hmm. and I was like, I really want to go back and just see what it's like to make a film. And and I had a lot of questions about my identity. Um, and I, I just wanted to go back and, and, um, see it for myself. Um, and so I had a producer who was Canadian. And so we just, we were like, let's go and do it. And then my parents again were like, what? <laughs> they were like, you're going back. So, so we did it. We got, you know, we, we went back and, and we found a local crew there. I had, a, I found like really amazing producers and, and we pulled it off and and we did a a beautiful little short film that then premiered at Tribeca, which is what led me to meet Sasha. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, it was it was just such an incredible experience to go back and and make this film. And I did the movie within the constraints of the rules there because, you know, Iran has a lot of, um, there's a lot of rules, there's a lot of censorship, and you have to sort of abide by the, um, the constraints. And we did everything pretty... Um, pretty um legally with yeah. permits and everything because I didn't want to get anyone in trouble and and, it, and the story didn't call for anything outside of you know it, it was very doable within the system yeah um you just you know filmmakers are so creative there because they they make such great work within the confines mm-hmm. um and it's I think it inspires a lot of creativity actually well that's I think one of the rules right if you're given a box what can you do in exactly it? yeah So I'm sure there are some people who are listening that have always dreamt of making their own film or movie. And they're like, what do you mean you just made it? So, of course, you were doing it within the constructs of having a program and having some guidance through the the MFA. When people want to start, what's the next thing? Is it finding a producer to help do all of the tasks and logistics? Like, what would be the, the first things? Well, the first thing is finding the story that you want to tell because mm-hmm. you're going to, you know, it's like blood sport making a film. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, it's just, it is really hard. And it's like pushing a truck up a mountain mm-hmm. through and through. And it's, so you have to find the story that you're willing to bleed for. Um, and after that, it's financing. Yeah. Um, so finding the money and sometimes you find the money before the producer, or sometimes you find the producer and they help you get the money. Um, but I think when you're starting off as a filmmaker, you, you kind of have to be a producer as well as the the director and the writer. Um, and I'm just starting to now after like, you know, 15 years of doing this, 
starting to not have to produce my own stuff. I'm starting to find producers that are like willing, you know, that are kind of legitimate and have access to financing and can help. But even my first feature, which is the one that's out now, it was, I became a producer on that even. So, you know, it's, it's really important to accept that responsibility that you're Mm -hmm. going to be, Everything. Um, you can be everything. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And that it's, it's, it's like a startup. It really mm-hmm. is. Like I really identify with entrepreneurs because yeah. being a filmmaker is a lot like being an entrepreneur. It's a lot, it's, it's, you can't really distance yourself from the business aspect of it, mm-hmm. um, especially when you're starting out. So it is, it's like a startup, you know, you have a, you have a concept, you get the financing, you make a business plan, you hire a team, um, mm-hmm. you execute the pro- product and then you have to figure out how to sell the product and promote the product. And yeah. I mean, it's just, it's very similar. So actually getting through this, this last film, which was like the biggest project I've done, I was listening to a lot of podcasts um, with entrepreneurs. Mm-hmm who had started businesses. Like there's that NPR podcast, How I Built This. One of my favorites. I love that podcast. And I was, you know, because I was like, I had taken on something pretty massive and it was, I was in a lot of new roles and Mm. I was like, how do I manage a budget? How do I, how do I lead? How do I lead a team? Yeah. Um, And so I found a lot of amazing interviews with, with female entrepreneurs, like the, um, the woman who invented Spanx. I remember like listening Sarah Blakely. To that. Yeah, yeah Sarah she's Blakely. a hero of so her. many of oh us. Oh my god! <laughs> I remember like driving to my film set and listening to her, and um, you know, and the the CEO of Glossier and yeah, Emily know, Weiss. Yes, Emily Weiss. Mm-hmm. She was just like I loved those interviews with women who who had just taken on this 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 endeavor and were kind of figuring out, you know, because you have to roll with the punches. You don't know what you're doing totally. You never do. You never do. It's, it's as a, as a business coach and as an entrepreneur running powerful ladies, it, the biggest misconception I think is that people assume people who are doing things out in the world know what they're doing. And it's like, nope, we're just the crazy ones enough to just start. Totally. Because once you get the ball rolling, what you actually think is the mountain is not at all. Like that, that once you climb the mountain, you're like, shit, that mountain's even bigger than one after I it. I know. I remember talking to my friends because this feature was such a massive project. It took me six years from start to finish. And I remember I kept describing the, exactly what you're saying to my female friends where I was yeah. like, I, I feel like I'm on the other side of the mountain. And then you look up and there's this whole other yes. <laughs> mountain still, like the top is so far. Because um, you keep thinking at every stage that you're on the other side of it. Yes. But then you're not. Like, you know, I, I got through like, I got through pre-production and then I got through production and I'm like, okay, after production, like we can just chill. Smooth and then sailing. Yeah. And then like <laughs> post-production was, it's like the biggest, you know, actually mountain that we faced. Um, and I was like, oh my God, <laughs> I didn't know. I still had like another year to go. Mm-hmm. Um, and you, yeah, you just kind of, you roll with the punches, you learn as you go, you try to be as patient and graceful as you can. Yes. <laughs> um, and you try to hopefully, you know, bring your team along because, mm-hmm. you know, part of it is just trying to get people to stick with you to see the project through. And yeah. I was lucky because I had um, people who really did, my producer and my lead actor, a lot of, you know, I had a lot of amazing cast members who supported me and, you um, and so I, I got lucky and I found some really good people who, who kind of stuck by me and, and were pretty loyal. Yeah. And it's so important because there's so many balls you're juggling. You don't want to have to add another. You're like, what do I have to do? I will hug you, pay you, love you. Like, please just stay. <laughs> yeah. Like, please. You know, I, I look at how important teams are in general. And there's a whole controversy about, you know, being self-made. Is it even possible? And I'm like, no, it's not possible. No. Are there people who had to create it from truly nothing versus others who may have had a uh, smoother start? Sure. But there's no way. There's no way to make anything in this world and be self-made. Totally. It's always a collaboration. And there Mm -hmm. are those people who give you a chance and work for you and stand by you and believe in you. Yes. And um, it's just, yeah, collaborate. I mean, especially in filmmaking, it's just not a singular uh, endeavor. It's a collaborative effort. It's all about your team. It's, it really is 
uh, the sum of its parts mm -hmm. and everyone, including the director, the writer, producer, it's, it's not about one person. It's about, you know, a, yeah. a large group of people bringing their talents to the table. And it is your job as the director to kind of like pick and choose and refine and make mm -hmm. it all work together. You're kind of like a conductor. Yes. Um, but ultimately it's like, a bunch of people's talents yeah on the screen yeah yeah you need every like everyone rise at once thank you <laughs> totally yeah so while you were going through six years of creating this film how did you keep yourself motivated and sane and continuing to be passionate about it because six years is a lot is like starting to push the patience and grace i would imagine totally and like just not having finances to yeah. support yourself through it. So it's also like, you know, and you hear like directors, their first film, everyone goes bankrupt on their first film. And like, that's true. Like you literally, you take such a hit mm -hmm. on your first film financially. So you're also struggling to be like, how am I going to make it through? Um, I mean, what got me through it, every stage was like a different sort of motiv motivation. I really believed in the message of this movie. I believed in the heart of the, of the film. Um, you know, it's, it's an imperfect film. There's like a lot, you know, it's literally like every shot is like being held up with scotch tape. It feels like, you know, a very, um, if I had more, obviously I would have, you know, done it different. So as a director, it's like kind of hard to watch at this point, but even despite like probably like 400 viewings, I still believe in the fundamental messaging of the movie and what it's trying to say. And it, mm -hmm. it has a very simple message, but I felt like it was an important time to, to tell this story and mm -hmm. to just remind everybody of this message that love is love, love, you know, transcends religious, cultural divides, mm -hmm. um, because this is such a divisive time we're living in. And it just felt like um, a good time to remind people of this message, um, as elemental as it is. Um, so that was motivating. I guess there was a kind of social social justice, you know, part of it yeah. that felt like I could ride, I could ride it for a long time. Mm -hmm. I could believe in it for a long time. Um, and the second, I think the second motivation was the people that came into my life because of this project. Um, and they inspired me and, and like, I love my DP on this film. His name is Ziv Berkovich. Um, and he just like, he, what his, he was so talented in his own right. And what he brought to the project really shifted the project and like seeing him mm -hmm. kind of what he could bring my lead actress, Tara Grammy and like, you know, everything she brought, my producers, uh, it was just like, it was, I was really inspired by my collaborators yeah. and they, my, my composer, my editor. I mean, everybody just going through the different stages and interacting with new creatives, mm -hmm. that was motivating. Yeah. You don't want to let them down. Totally. Mm -hmm. And it was just like, at every stage, there was like some fresh blood, you know, yeah. it was like, okay, now it's like time with the composer. And he had this, he had a whole bag of, you know, new tricks and like, yeah. it was just amazing. It just, I love that. I love that part of the collaboration was, was just going from one artist to the next and collaborating with them in, yeah. in a different way. How awesome. No, and I, I think it's so, having that energy cycle come back to you. Yes. Because when you're creating something uh, as a as a creative, as an entrepreneur, like whenever you're the person generating the thing, <laughs> like pushing it from behind, you need that supply of other energy and vitality from it. Because so often, at least from my experience, you can correct me if I'm wrong for yours, but sometimes you look at yourself going like, who actually wants this? And then you start working with other people like, oh, okay, I'm not losing my mind. This is actually a thing. And it's important. Totally. Exactly. It's like that energy mm -hmm. that you get from new collaborators. It's it's really miraculous. Yes. Yeah. And and needed because mm -hmm. I also love in, especially whether they tell it on how I built this or other entrepreneurial stories or just people making things that it's very much like your own story is a hero's journey of its own. And each kind of project is its own hero's journey. And there's going to be moments when you are so tested and you think like, I thought I was going to take like five minutes. This is taking five years or I didn't know it cost as much. Like you name it, something's going to go wrong. And it could be on the project. It could be personal. It could be both. 
And it's, it really comes down to believing in that why. And it, it has to be strong enough. Like, totally. Mm-hmm. And, you know, something that I, I really identified with in those listening to the to those other women creating these products mm-hmm. was to some extent it starts out as something that you need for yourself. Mm-hmm. Like you want to make it for yourself because I, I want to see this. Um, so I'll just make this thing for myself. And like, you know, you don't think, oh, it's going to turn into this like long yes. six year project with like so many people and so much, so many challenges, but it just starts off in this very like simple, naive place. Yeah. Of, like, <laughs> You know, for me, I was just, I was, I wasn't even thinking I would ever make like a romantic comedy. Mm-hmm. Um, but there was just this time where I was like, you know what? I want to make a romantic comedy. I want to make a movie within a popular genre that represents my world and the people in my world. Because I don't see the diversity in my world represented, mm-hmm. um, especially within a popular genre like the rom-com. Yeah. So I never thought I would make a rom-com, but it just like at that time I was like, you know, I feel like seeing this. <laughs> and that's literally where it started. It was just mm-hmm. like, I want to see this myself. Um, I want to see an Iranian woman uh as the lead role in this popular genre. I've never seen that before. Mm-hmm. And it's my experience. And it's uh, and so yeah, it just starts off there with something that you just want to see for yourself. And then, it, yeah. and then it's amazing when other people want to see it. You know, right now it's like there's so many um, Persian women and, you know, that are just like the outpour of like support and like them being like, I can't believe I, I'm seeing my life in a movie. Mm-hmm. Um, that's, How powerful is that for you? It's so incredible because I they, they connected to it because they've never seen their experience represented. Um, and that's really been so fulfilling, especially the, the, this last uh, couple of months that it's been released into the world. What else has surprised you from the feedback you've received? Um, just how accessible the movie is to so many different kinds of people, um, because it's a, it's about an Iranian woman and a and a white guy, and you know them bringing their very different families together, and and them navigating modern love. Um, and all of the challenges that come with modern dating and and mm-hmm. and and falling in love with someone that's fundamentally different from you in many ways. Um, and that I feel like is it that's my favorite response is when um multicultural couples come up to me that aren't necessarily Iranian or white. They're, mm-hmm. you know, like I had this I just screened in San Diego and there was an Ethiopian woman and a Mexican guy who had gotten married and they really identified with their stories, even though they weren't, it wasn't specifically their culture, but they just, they were like the exact same thing happened to us. This is just like our families. (laughs) And like, it's really cathartic to see it on screen. Um, And, and just seeing them raise multicultural children and like bringing, bringing, um, both of their cultures together and and educating yeah. each other but like I just love that I love these stories of like cross cultural um love and I've seen it in my own family a lot and it's always really inspired me yeah um and so seeing people connect um and it that, that it, the fact that it transcends beyond the specific cultural groups in the movie that's my my favorite it's really yes. touching yes check yeah. that box <laughs> yeah it's really it's really profound yeah, yeah. I'm always fascinated by seeing cross-cultural families and how they navigate what, um, how they navigate blending their own culture and past prior to meeting each other with like how they're raising their children. And often they're raising their children in a different place than where either of them are from and maybe speaking different languages. And suddenly you like, you know, I had this experience from living abroad and like seeing a Swedish person and an English person raising a family in Germany. Right. You're like, your kids are German. You're different, something else. Like your family nucleus is like a whole mishmash of things. Like, how do you pick and choose? Do you have to worry about it? Do you have this pressure from your families to make sure that this is happening or this isn't happening? And I just find it all fascinating. Totally. Because it's all these questions that we all have to deal with on some level. And often we're not paying attention to it at the degree that they have to be mindful of it if they choose to. Yeah, it's it's like um, inventing your own culture. Yes, with within your family and picking and choosing, um, 
you know, I think it's so cool. Like multicultural couples are so cool because they they can pick and choose from their respective traditions mm -hmm. um, and build something new within their own family. And I've seen that again in my own family so much. Like I have an uncle who's Iranian and he moved to Paris in the 70s and then he met his wife in a uh, ESL class in a, in a foreign language class learning French and she's from Japan. And so they got married and had two kids and the kids are half Japanese, half Iranian, but they're French. Yeah. <laughs> um, and like that was, and like they're, it's such a funny household because it's like, there's a sushi night and then the next night it's Iranian food. And then it's, and then, but then they're like so French, you know, yeah. <laughs> with all of the, you know, yeah. and, and, um, and my own family and, and growing up in DC too, it's a very international city. So mm -hmm. my family's, um, mixed a lot with um, Hispanic cultures, Jewish, African American. I mean, there's everything. Um, and so going to all of these multicultural weddings has was also kind of what inspired the yeah. the story because I was like, this is really beautiful. And and in this time where like it's just like such a divisive time, yeah. That I'm like, we really need to remember that you know this this exists and this is worth celebrating and and I mean diversity is always I have always seen it as such a promotion like it's such yes. a bonus yes in our humanity and and to see that politically being sort of deleted or or you know it's just it I don't understand it when uh, when I was growing up um I spent a lot of my elementary school years outside of Philadelphia and I remember celebrating everything like whatever holiday came up if there was somebody in the world that was celebrating it, we did some sort of exercise on it. And to hear that some schools now are removing all cultural and religious and things, because they're like, okay, if we can't celebrate, we have to celebrate nothing. And I'm like, I think that's actually the opposite of what we're supposed to be doing. Like, I like learning about this stuff is fun, especially for kids. And I would rather celebrate all of it, like, uh, it's a small world all the time and get to share and tell the stories. Like there's so much humanity in all of this. Like, why are we taking the humanity part away? Especially when like we just filled out our census online and it didn't, it just asked for our race plus any ethnic background notes that we knew. And I'm like, well, for crying out loud, like I need a paragraph. Like I am a second or longer generation American. So like, there's so many things that could be listed and I'm, one of the least diverse people in America at the same time. <laughs> so how do we get to celebrate all of it? Like, totally. I mean, I, I think yeah. that's, it's such a great, it's such an asset really, mm -hmm. you know, to be able to, to be a multicultural society and to have all yeah. these great ri rituals and, and food and, and ways of, you know, celebrating that we can all, um, that we can all incorporate in our own lives. Yeah. I mean, it just, yeah, it just doesn't make sense to me why we would, you know, we wouldn't celebrate our diversity. I just, yeah, I yes. don't. I feel like Canadian society, when I, I go was there. just going to go they, there. The way they celebrate <laughs> multiculturalism is like, it's my dream. Like, I just yes. like, there's so much correctness in the way they embrace multiculturalism. And Did Canadianism I, at the same time. Yes, yes, totally. Yes. I mean, when you see like their conservative president go to like the Sikh community in the like in the garb and like wish them a happy new year, you're like, this is their conservative party, you know? And yes. they're just like, they're just celebrating um, their traditions because it's like every ritual. Yes. Like, that's what I love about Sasha's book too, is mm -hmm. it really is a celebration of ritual. Yes. Um, and she talks about that a lot in her book. And I, I love that. I love that it's, it's um, everyone needs to celebrate. Everyone needs ritual. Yes. And it's like, it's something that every culture turns to that specific ritual for a reason. There's like a wisdom behind it. And mm -hmm. so the fact that we can access that is just, it seems like a no brainer. It seems so cool to learn about it. Yes. And I, I truly was about to bring up Canada as soon as you did. I love that we're on the same page on this because I'm so impressed at how they not only handle multiculturalism, but how they use their, I guess, national PR to promote com uh, multiculturalism, to onboard people when they become Canadians, to still have a clear Canadian culture and to show how it can all live together. Mm -hmm. I was there during um, in Montreal during the Olympics in January a couple of years ago, and I would be working back at my hotel room after you know meetings all day, 
And my jaw would drop at how they were, what their commercials were between the Olympic performances. Cause they were a mix of like, I think they truly had a campaign that was like what it means to be Canadian. Like we're more than just nice, I think was the slogan. <laughs> and then it would show all these different people who are Canadians, different everything. And the fact that they were all, all came back together that they were Canadians and they were nice. And I'm like, why don't we do internal PR in the U.S.? Like, what? It would make such a difference if if the conversation was, look how different we are and look at how we're all nice. Absolutely. Yeah. No, there's so much about the way they embrace multiculturalism. I wish we did in the the United States, for sure. Yeah. Well, I think it also speaks to the fact that they they accept how connected they are as a culture. Mm -hmm. Um. Whereas, unfortunately, in the U.S., so often we think, like, it's every man for themselves. And I'm like, that's not true. That's not how it's ever been. We None of America would have happened. Yeah. Again, coming full circle to why you need a team. Yes. But it's like, no, like, there's so many people helping everyone all the time. Let's just acknowledge it. Yeah. And whether <laughs> we like it or not, as we can see with what's going on right now, we are so interconnected. Mm-hmm. Like, our well-being is directly impact it like it, we're just we're all interconnected yes. but you know it's we can't it's really impossible to isolate um our humanity like it's just we are we need each other we yes. we depend on each other and it's yeah and so i think multiculturalism is just it's fun it's like a way to celebrate mm-hmm. um and learn from each other so i don't know i i feel like that was a message i really wanted to um to tell in this in this movie and it just the mm-hmm. timing because I ended up making it after after Trump was elected and stuff so I was like I felt even more motivated to make the film yeah. um, after the election mm-hmm. and now that it is available it's at Amazon and where else is it available iTunes iTunes how has that changed your life that your movie is available on Amazon well that's new uh, we just wrapped up our theatrical literally on Friday. Um, Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. And um, we, we got lucky because of everything that's happening. Um, it kind of went into the streaming right in time before everyone was like quarantined. Um, and now that they're home, they can all watch yeah, it. <laughs> yeah. So the, the online sharing is is new. So we'll, f- we'll see how that plays out in the next month or two. Mm-hmm. Um, but generally, the response has been really loving. I mean, people have really appreciated the film. And um, and romantic comedies are generally relaxing. You know, it's not a stressful movie. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's pretty fun and uplifting. And um, and I love that it's, it's it, there are multi-generational storylines. And that's been nice to just play to not just a multicultural audience, but a multi-generational one. Because um, I think a lot of older people can access one of the storylines that's played by Rita Wilson. Um, and she, they love that storyline. And I, I've gotten a lot of feedback from um, older women about, about that. Mm-hmm. Um, so just connecting with so many different types of people across cultures and age has been really yeah. rewarding. How has your life changed going from New York to LA? Um, you know, I, I never wanted to move to LA. I never thought I was going to take the plunge because I was such a, I'm such an East coaster. Like I grew up in, in near DC and, and I was in New York and I, I love that East coast kind of groundedness. Me too. Yeah. (laughs) And that you're from Boston, right? Yes. Um, yeah, I just, I love that culture. It just feels more, um, on the ground, you know, grounded and, um, I just never thought I could leave it. And, but I mean, you know, it was just time because our industry is so um, entrenched in in LA and Hollywood and there is a lot more going on here. Um, But I've surprisingly, I've really liked it. Yeah. Um, I think the fact that it has been so much better for work has made me like the city more. Mm -hmm. I mean, the weather is like really, it's really nice to like skip winter. Yes. Um, (laughs) But more than that, I've, I've, I feel really inspired by this city. Um, there is a large Iranian presence in this city. Mm-hmm. They all kind of, I guess this community came like in the 70s. And so connecting with the Iranian uh, population in LA has been really interesting. And they've been really supportive of of me and my work and um, especially getting this movie made. I mean, it's, yeah. it's they've been such a, 
an incredible community for me. So I feel really inspired um, more than I thought I would be Mm -hmm. living here. No, that's amazing. It's it's, um, a city that has so much to offer when you go looking for it. Yeah, it's it's mm-hmm. all about the enclave here. You know, yes. it's like it's it's not, and it's shot. It's weird. It surprisingly reminds me of Tehran a lot. It's a similar type of city in the sense that like it's it's urban and it's dense, but it's a driving city. Mm-hmm. And you know, Tehran is similar. Like you kind of you go, you drive, and then you go to someone's house, and then it's like this whole world. And it's it, and then the hills and the mountains are just yeah. It's. I can see maybe why they all came here because they're just there's a similarity geographically, yeah, and cult, yeah, and just visually it reminds you of this like urban city in the mountains, yeah. Um, but it it's such a and what I love about Los Angeles is it's very new, you know, it's it's very inventive and it is mm-hmm. kind of um, they're not as attached to tradition and like old, you know, East Coast feels like more European. Yeah. Um, So there's something kind of innovative about California and and Los Angeles that's inspiring. There's definitely the element of freedom, right? Like nothing is too crazy. Nothing is, um, nothing's unacceptable. Nothing's, you know, almost impossible at this point either. Whereas there are definitely a lot more rules and like the way things maybe should be on the East Coast yeah. sometimes. Yeah, well, there's less history, mm-hmm. I think. In the East Coast, there's a little more, it's more historic, and it's yeah. still, I think, con- more connected to European culture, whereas mm-hmm. here it's just, it's so American. It's so new and yeah. and and just innovative. Um, so that part of it has been interesting. It's It can be cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We talked um, earlier about how important your girlfriends are. What is the impact having a close-knit of women friends been for you and your life and the choices that you've made in it? Mm-hmm. Um, they're a lifeline. Um, they're, they're just like the strong voices in my head that are constantly advocating for me and reminding me not to settle mm-hmm. and sell myself short. And, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I go to them for counsel. It's like having like a, like a like counselors, yeah, like all the time, and we just you know, and it's we support each other through big decisions and um and just gray areas, you know. Um, but I think you know, I, I I have a friend who I met through actually Sasha through this. We had this like uh, women's group in New York, and you know, a lot of them are in the industry too. And so every time I make a creative decision, I like run it back by her. And I'm like, is this good? Is this bad? Should I do this? You know? And she just has the best advice. You know, Mm -hmm. she's like a super, uh, very intelligent, uh, creative. And, and so she's been such a lifeline in my professional decisions. Yes. And I imagine, well, I believe that we're so bad sometimes at making good decisions for ourselves. I couldn't imagine not having a network that I could, as you said, like not settle for things and make sure you're pushing yourself where you need to and also acknowledging yourself for like all the awesome things that you do do. Totally. Mm-hmm. I I also went to, in film school, I, I found a group of women in film school. They're all female filmmakers. And we started a writing group. Um, for, at, for, at Columbia, so because we graduated and we were like, oh my god, what? How are we going to workshop our our scripts and like, mm-hmm. how, you know, because that was something we did in film school a lot was we were workshopping our screenplays, um, and so we st- formed this group. Um, it's like seven female screenwriters, and we gave ourselves a name. We're called the Bush Administration. <laughs> And we're a female group of writers and we workshop our screenplays through this group. And so that's also been really vital and um, just getting, you know, being with female screenwriters and and being able to workshop our our scripts. And it's the best feedback because we've all had the same training. Um, And it's just that's also been like a fantastic group of women who have supported um, my writing and and vice versa. And same with them. We just we've and a lot of our work has been made that we've workshopped within this group. So that's cool. been yeah a really essential group for um for my writing. There's so much discussion about where women's roles are in the film and TV industry, and 
based on the media, you would assume that there's like five people working in the industry and they're all being suppressed. And how is it being in a, a woman in the industry? What do you see from the inside out? And how do you think things, are things changing for the better? Are they still have lots of improvement? Like what's real based on you on the ground? Mm-hmm. Um, I think there is a shift happening that feels genuine. It doesn't feel like a fad. I think after Me Too and Time's Up and these movements um, and these stories that have been exposed, there's no, I don't think it would be possible to go back mm-hmm. um, to wait, to the way things were. Um, so I think the shift is real. It's just going to take a while, um, because it's just, it's, it's uncomfortable for a lot of people to, to like, to open the doors and, you know, it's, it is going to take a long time to have gender parity in Hollywood, but I think it, it, we're on our way and, um, a lot of doors are opening up for women in, writing, directing, producing, everything. Um, but it's just, it's it's sad that it had to get to this point where there's been, you know, these stories that you hear. And yes. It's just like, it, it's sad that it took, you know, like criminal activity <laughs> to like, yeah. to just to balance things out. Mm-hmm. Um, but I mean, it's, it's, it's new. I mean, you can see it in every industry, you know, like just what we just saw with Elizabeth Warren and, you know, it, it's just yes. going to take a long time to have a balance in power. And it's, I think it's hard for even good men to relinquish power, you know, mm-hmm. because it, you do have to make room for all these new people and yes, to, to, to have the same opportunities. But I mean, fundamentally the problem is, and I think this is the fundamental problem of female disempowerment is women just don't have access to finances the way men do. And that's across the board. Yes. Um, you know, before sex and harassment and all this, all this stuff, the, the root of it is we just don't have access to finances the way men do. You know, when you hear these stories, you know, about Harvey Weinstein and like these, yeah. you know, the situations that these women were in, like they wouldn't be in those situations had they had access to financing for their projects. You know, it's so it's just such a big problem. Um, and I was just on this panel um, with other women and one was in the finance industry, one was in uh, the NGO industry, and and I was representing um, Hollywood. And and that was like what we concluded on this panel was just like, there's just a lack of access um, that we don't have and we've never had in history. And that's part of, you know, the problem. So if, you know, if that starts to shift and if Hollywood is going to be the first industry to sort of lead the way, then that would be great. But it's, I think it's, um, it's going to take a while. Like I just directed my first episode of, of TV, um, this show called Good Girls on NBC and that that's like a you know badass showrunner Jenna Bands she's a really awesome showrunner she's um so smart she's a feminist like she's just so cool um and so I got that gig through this initiative called mm-hmm. the NBC Female Forward program which is an initiative that NBC has started for to bring more women in and and give them their first episodes um so you know, these initiatives help. Um, and a lot of people are like, oh, well, why couldn't you just get the job like a normal person? You know, you made a film and, you know, you have a degree from Columbia. Like, why can't, why couldn't you just get your, you know, why did you have to go through initiative? And I'm like, well, you know, it's, it's just like, that's just where we are. We have to go through initiatives right now. and, And hopefully one day you can just get hired without going through like an intense vetting process and program, you know, that men don't have to go through, but, you know, at least we have this right now. At least this is like taking a step forward. And, um, so it's a door that opened for you. Why not take it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think, you know, it's, I mean, time will tell, but I think I, it does feel like Hollywood is opening up to more women, um, behind the camera, but also more stories that are, 
and more per- new perspectives and new voices. Mm-hmm. It does seem like they're more curious now about diversity and inclusion and in, in a kind of genuine way. So we'll see. When you landed the TV directing opportunity, was that a bucket list check for you? Like how exciting was that? Oh, amazing. I mean, it was such a long vetting process. Like, you know, I interviewed for months. Um, it was, and then I had to shadow for for months um, before I could do it. So it was like, I felt really ready by the time I, w- I was up to do it. Um, but it was, it definitely felt like, yeah, it felt big. It felt like, okay, a door just opened to me that, you know, that I, I, I really wanted. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, it was just, it was, it did feel like a, a big monumental moment. Um, yeah, it, 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 it was great. I mean, and I had such a great experience. It's such a good show. There's so many good people involved. Um, it was just like a wonderful experience from top to bottom. Being someone in the film industry, when have you had a fangirl moment? Or do you get them? Oh my God, so many. <laughs> I fangirl out so much. Um, Has there been a moment where you've kind of embarrassed yourself or have you been able to keep it under control? Oh my gosh. I mean, I, no, I mean, like I try to keep it cool, (laughs) (laughs) but um, I'm just trying to think um, of my last like major fangirl moment. Um, I mean, I have so many, especially like in politics too, I think. Mm When I've met Hillary Clinton, I like melt it. I like, I was just like, <laughs> oh my God. Um, She's real. Yeah. And she was, yeah, I definitely kind of was amazed when I met her. Um, gosh. Yeah. I mean, I'm trying to think. There, there's so many. I mean, the show I just worked on, like, I, I love those women. I love the women that work on that show. There's, For people who don't know who's on that show. Yeah. Well, Christina Hendricks, Retta, Mae Whitman. And the showrunners, Jenna Bands, who I'm a big fan of. Um, and then I, I met this writer. She wrote Reality Bites. And I that was like one of my favorite Love movies it. as a teenager. And I, when I met her, I fangirled out. I was like, oh, my God. I just like that was such an iconic movie uh, for me in, in the 90s. I was a 90s teen. so Me too. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, all the time. I'm I'm just inspired by so many women. So many of them are my friends too. Like Sasha, I love Sasha. Like she's yeah. like I'm her fan. Mm-hmm. I fan girl out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it, for me, I was like, it was a moment of like, wait, somebody whose work I respected, who have never met, said yes to my work, and then we had an amazing conversation. Where I'm yeah. like, yep, we're gonna be friends forever. This is awesome. Yeah. I her mother. I just went to the the premiere of Cosmos. Her mother. I fan girl out when I meet when I talk to her mother. She is like. Yeah. Oh my God. She's like, um, prophetic. Like Mm -hmm. she's just so incredible. I love hearing Andrean speak. It's really, really inspiring. Um, so those are sort of the most recent moments where I I felt really inspired. When you think of powerful ladies, what is, what did those words mean to you and what did they represent for you? Hmm. Self-reliance perseverance um i think women who have vision um and who are just just positive and and active in a really um relentless way like they just won't stop you yeah. know <laughs> um the, so i'm really inspired by women who are yeah who are just very persistent you know, and I, I, I love, I love, I mean, I'm, I've never been so inspired by like female politicians as I am right now. Like the, the mm-hmm. superstars that we're seeing rise in politics is like riveting. Yeah. Um. So I, that's something I follow very closely, like the next female um, politician who, who, you know, there's so many of them. I mean, this race was so close, you know, there were so many good ones. I was a big Elizabeth Warren fan. Mm-hmm. Um. So I was, definitely disappointed. Um, but I followed her. I mean, she was just, you know, I just, I mean, I don't know if you saw her interview with Rachel Maddow. Um, but it was just, you know, she was, she ran a great campaign. She's intelligent. She's smart. She's age appropriate. She would have been a great voice to listen to every day, you know, 
Um, So, yeah, I mean, I, I love seeing sort of women rise in politics. I saw her give her first press release after declaring she wouldn't be running for president. And I felt it was the one of the most authentic moments of her speaking that I saw throughout the campaign. And I almost had wished it had come sooner. Mm-hmm. But there was something when she said that the biggest impact to her was the fact that women and girls wouldn't see a president for at least four more years. And she almost burst into tears. Like I so connected with that individual moment. Because whether I think we realize it on a daily basis or not, I do feel the um, the weight of like how much more can we push? How much more can we make sure is available to anyone, regardless of gender or whatever else they have? And I know that for what's happened with Powerful Ladies and how it's kind of snowballed beyond, as you mentioned, like a thing for me mm-hmm. <laughs> to now this thing that other people um, want and like hope keeps showing up. Like that, the biggest pressure I feel for myself now is like making sure I keep delivering like the best thing possible for, you know, everyone listening. And when she said that moment, I was like, oh, like it's, it, this is so much bigger than um, the petty choices that often lead to any political decision that ends up coming up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, you want to see it in your lifetime, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it it was a tough, it was a tough day because you were like, I, actually, I work I, at this co-working space called the Jane Club, which oh, yeah. is June Raphael's um, space. And I, she's I, on our list for oh, the podcast. Yeah. I yeah. love <laughs> her, and I love everything she's doing there. And mm-hmm. I, you know, that day I was so glad I was there because I was with everyone, and and um, and there was some like weepy, weepy moments, you know. But it just it was so nice to be in a space. Um, with other women who who have the same hopes and mm-hmm. dreams of seeing more female leadership. Um, and it, it was a day where you're like, oh, it's never going to be the right time. It's never going to be the right person. And there was a little bit of despair, but then it's, it's going to happen. You know, mm-hmm. it's going to happen eventually. And it's just a matter of time. But I think a lot of people, men included, want to see more balance in power and and more female leadership and it couldn't get any worse you know <laughs> we couldn't do any worse yeah i mean it, and i think me being from iran you know which is a very patriarchal system and and it's a country that like kind of imploded like in the, on its in itself for a variety of reasons but it's really um it's just such a dream to to be to see more women mm-hmm. in in, in leadership roles, particularly in politics. With your passion for that and your background in journalism and the storytelling and making sure all voices are heard, does it drive you to want to be in politics ever? You know, I I thought, you know, growing up in D.C., you're just, you're political. I mean, I, I'm Iranian, so I'm inherently a political person. I, yeah. I'm, I listen to, you know, my you grew up just talking about politics at a very young age because... Iran was so troubled politically and there was so much, um, so much of it had to do with um, religion and gender. It's woven into your story. Yeah. And you become very politically aware um, as a young, uh, very young, like before even you're a teenager, you're, mm-hmm. you know, because it's just your family is talking about it and it's affecting your reality. Like the fact that we had to immigrate and yes. we fled war and we migrated and, you know, we had to become immigrants and, you know, it's just, and it was all because of political reasons. Um, so you become aware politically very early. Um, and I grew up in DC. Um, mm-hmm. and so even like in heights, you know, you're all my, fr- all my, I have a good group of girlfriends, core group of girlfriends from my childhood. And, um, and they, they're also very involved most of them have become attorneys. And, and so, you know, we talk about politics a lot. I don't think I'll, I think I'm, I don't think I'll go into politics. You know, I never wanted to go to law school, but I'm, I feel like making my own political impact through the movies I want to make and the mm-hmm. stories I'm telling and the way I hope to influence culture. Yeah. Um, and it started out with a romantic comedy, you know, it's like, I just, you know, it's, it's funny cause everyone's like, you're so serious. Why did you make a romantic comedy? I'm like, no, I just, I wanted to reach as many people as I could. Yeah. And, and I wanted to do that within a popular genre. And, um, 
Well, you've also done music videos. Like you've you've directed a, a wide variety of, um, you know, not platforms, but what would you call it? Types. Yeah, I've types done documentaries, mm -hmm. and um, I directed a documentary series for MTV about a female um, Iranian heavy metal singer um, who was a really amazing artist, very radical woman who was very brave. Um, and what's that called? It's called, well, the show was called Rebel Music, um, and it was a docu-series about um, rebel musicians in conflict countries. And the episode I did was about this heavy metal artist from Iran who was exiled and um, is now living as a refugee in Turkey. And her her journey um, as a as a heavy metal vocalist, um, and she had a mohawk, like she was a super rad yeah. uh, woman, and she was very brave. Um, and I really I love directing that. I had a co-director named Roxana Vilk, who's also a cool f feminist director. Um, and I love doing that. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, I just want to tell women's stories and 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 the genre, the, the vehicle doesn't really matter for me, whether mm -hmm. it's like a documentary or a romantic comedy or a political drama or a historical period drama. I just want to tell female forward stories um, because we need to, they're just, we don't see them as much as we should and we don't hear them as and, much as we should. And they don't, because women are not just serious and significant, like it's okay that they're mixed with, with the normal and the mundane and the silly and the, the, the romantic part too, I think. Like, I think there's a, a trying to write what women are is really just like really opening the door that like we're all of it. So like, why wouldn't we tell stories in all of these spaces? Yeah. I mean, we represent half of the world population. You if know? not more often. <laughs> yeah. And we deserve to see ourselves um, represented. So mm -hmm. that's, I think, my vocation. It's it's what drives me to be a filmmaker and a storyteller mm -hmm. um, is, is just to represent um just new voices and new stories. And um, right now I'm getting sent a lot of scripts. I never thought I would direct other people's screenplays, mm -hmm. but now I'm like, you know, I'm getting sent so many scripts that, and, and I'm reading them and I'm like, this is amazing. This is like, there's so many female writers that have stories about their own experiences across industries. Like I just mm -hmm. read this screenplay about a woman in Silicon Valley and like her you know, her, her trials and tribulations of like trying to get a startup off the ground. You know, it's just incredible. Like mm -hmm. there's so many stories like that and they all deserve to be made and seen and celebrated. And um, so, yeah, that's really what drives me. And uh, so I'm curious now what you're up to next, that your most recent movie is now available mm -hmm. online. We can all watch it. And like, what's next? Are you picking a script to direct next? Or are you doing your own project? Both. I'm um, I'm going up for some directing jobs that uh, where I would direct um, other female scripts, mm -hmm. um, and some of them are male scripts too. I mean, like I don't want to yeah. like you know I the men in my life are so feminist. Like my friend group of men are just like they're so incredible, and I I want to represent them too because that's also like you know I tried to do that in the movie. Like there's mm -hmm. this archetype of like ma mili like militant male feminists that are just like so amazing, and I, I'm lucky I'm friends with so many of them. But um, so I don't want to like you know divide yeah in that sense. But um, you don't either. <laughs> yeah. Um. But yeah, I might be directing. Um other people's scripts. I'm also writing a lot. I'm writing my own uh, screenplays and and I have a feature and a pilot I'm working on. And so I'm just writing as much as I can right now and also reading. And so it's just a time to be reading and writing right now for mm -hmm. me. For people who would love to write a screenplay, how do they begin? Well, again, it starts with the story yeah. um, and the character. Um, for me, actually, it starts with like a character first, mm -hmm. somebody that I'm just totally fascinated with and I want to see them go on an emotional journey. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say, who is your story about um, and what is their emotional journey? And I would start from there. And then plot and all that comes after you've really answered these two mm -hmm. fundamental questions. 
Um, to answer those two questions and just start writing and yeah, see where it goes. Yeah, I think it's like who is mm-hmm. your character and what is their emotional journey? I think that those that's that's the first place to start. Yeah. And, you know, because you can learn, to, even if you didn't go to film school, you can write mm-hmm. a screenplay. You can, mm-hmm. there's so many books, there's like online, there's master classes, you know. Yeah. It's really just, it's it's like the character and the, and the, and the emotional journey that really sort of is the, is the skeleton of, of, mm-hmm. of a movie. Uh, we ask everyone on the show where they put themselves in the powerful lady scale, uh, <laughs> zero being average everyday human and 10 being the most powerful lady you can imagine. Where would you put yourself today? And where do you think you would put yourself on average? Oh my God. I have to rate myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, Oh my God. I don't know. I, I, <laughs> I mean, today versus like in the future or in the past. Yeah. On an average day, where would you put yourself in today? Where do you yeah. put yourself? I mean, in the past, I definitely feel in the past, it, I felt like I was maybe like a five, four or five. And I feel higher in the scale now because mm-hmm. I did manage to push a truck up a mountain and test my limits. Mm-hmm. And um, you have work out in the world. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, totally. I mean, you, you kind of, um, you know, it's something I think I question and I think a lot of women question is their ability, their own abilities, their own um, capabilities to be self-reliant mm-hmm. um, and to be independent. And that's something that I think I really question more. And as I get older, I feel more confident in my abilities mm-hmm. to be independent um, and that's something that is I'm looking forward to in the future is just gaining more confidence in your judgment and in your um, in your capability. And it, I mean, it's also like mm-hmm. experience and age helps. Yes. Um, but I think as women, we struggle with it a little bit more. Like that, are we? Am I making the right choice? Kind of conversation. Yeah. Just like mm-hmm. just confidence is 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 I think uh, something we struggle with more. Um, and entitlement Mm -hmm. because I mean, like, you know, even everything that's happened in the last five years, um, with, with like me too. And I look, I mean, like those were strong, powerful women Yes, that should not have been in those situations, but they were. Why? Mm -hmm. Because they didn't have the entitlement and confidence that they could, you know, get their projects made or they could do what they wanted to do. You know, there's so much disempowerment. Um, and and I think, you know, when I see the younger generations, my cousin now is in at NYU film school and she's she's 20. And when I hear her talk the way she speaks, it's like it's I feel so hopeful mm-hmm. that she is gonna be coming into the industry in a post Time's Up yeah. era. And, um, and hopefully she won't face those, those, you know, ridiculous challenges. It'll just, she'll, she'll feel more entitled. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's something I hope in the future, it'll be like a 10. Yeah. <laughs> you're you're getting there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what are things that you put into practice to keep yourself at your best and in your most powerful state? I mean, health and wellness and self-care is essential. I mean. Mm-hmm. What does that mean to you? Um, Diet, exercise, women's groups, you know, just, you know, conferencing with my strong female, powerful women's clubs. Yeah. Um, whether it's like uh, my, 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 you know, New York crew or my film school crew, or my home, home girl crew. I mean, it's just their lifeline. So they're part of my self care, really. Um, you know, talking to my mother and my aunt and, you know, just really conferencing with other strong women. So it's really, you know, health, diet, exercise, meditation, Mm -hmm. um, and my female cohort. All the ladies. All the ladies. (laughs) We're so lucky that we're like comfortable, you know, having these groups because sometimes my partner was like, you know, he didn't, he didn't have a group like this, you know? Yeah. And I'm like, I think as women, we are, um, we feel uh, more comfortable uh, conferencing and it's such a lifeline. I'm trying to get, my dad is retired now. I'm trying to get him to have like a male 
cohort. You know, yes. I'm like you need like a man man's group. You guys yes. need like a book club. You need to talk about, you know, things that you guys are going through and you need to be with other people your age who are at the same stage of life because mm-hmm. it's really therapeutic. Um, and so like, and they just are like, never like had that, you know? <laughs> and I'm like, I keep yeah. trying to form like a fraternity for him. <laughs> I totally understand. You know, even our, um, our brother's 25 and I'm like, you should be coming to the Powerful Ladies events, but you need your own events. <laughs> yeah. Like, who who are your people? And I, I mean, not that he does have his friends and a crew that he, you know, goes back to for support. But I think it's different when, you know, women seeking community, I think is very, it's automatic. It's yes. natural for us. And I think also because there's always, we want to be learning kind of what else we need to know. It's It's more natural, I think, also at least our generation where like mentorship started becoming encouraged. Like I'm to be around women who are up to amazing things. Like that lights me up. Mm -hmm. Like it inspires me for whatever I'm up to. It's, it's, I see all the opportunities to connect and support and help each other. And I'm like, I hope men are doing this Mm -hmm. because we, we don't, we're not looking for the pendulum to swing the opposite way. Like no. We want everyone to like we want balance. have their people. Yes. Yeah. We just want balance. Mm-hmm. We want the scales to balance. That's all. We don't want more or yeah, it's no. and it's really wonderful to see all these spaces that have been created in the last few years, like like the Jane Club and, mm-hmm. and the Wing. And um there's there's so many more. And I think these are these spaces that have just been created recently are very much a reaction to mm-hmm. um you know, the, these, these movements that, that have surfaced in the last few years. So they've been, so much good has come out of um, those stories. Yes. And I think it's, we're only going to go up in the spectrum of mm-hmm. feeling more confident and powerful. 100%. Is there anything else that we haven't touched on that you would love to share with everyone listening right now? Oh my gosh. I don't. <laughs> I don't I, I don't think so. I think that we did yeah, we covered all Perfect. the ground. My movie's on Amazon and iTunes. It's called A Simple Wedding. I'll just do a little promo plug at the end. Sure. Um, so please um please download it and and enjoy it. It's a nice lighthearted rom com that um that shows some new faces on the screen. So I like that. Yes. Well, thank you so much for being a yes to powerful ladies and thank sharing you. your story with all of us. Um, you know, powerful ladies that are recommended by other powerful ladies really are my favorite and i'm so excited to have a new friend in la and see how we can support you thank you so much thanks for having me on the show thank you you. it was such a pleasure to meet and chat with sarah from how we're all connected through our humanity to how storytelling only works when you're truly committed, and her passion for telling the great stories that exist out there right now. I feel so many parallels to my own perspective and drive and why I built Powerful Ladies that it's such a nice thing to find another sister in arms. I'm also so excited for you guys to go and watch her film, The Simple Wedding. It is so good. We watched it this past weekend, and I'm glad that all of you can enjoy it and have a little happiness during this quarantine. Go and watch it now. To connect, support, and follow Sarah, you can follow her on Instagram and Twitter at Sarah Zendaya. You can also um, go to her website, sarahzendaya.com, and we're going to have all the links in the show notes at thepowerfulladies.com forward slash podcast. That include her Facebook, LinkedIn, email, and of course, all the links to her things on iTunes and Amazon. I hope you've enjoyed this new episode of the Powerful Ladies podcast. If you're a yes to Powerful Ladies and want to support us, you can subscribe to this podcast anywhere you listen to podcasts. Make sure to give us a five-star rating and leave a powerful review on Apple Podcasts. You can also be one of our Patreons for as little as $1 a month at patreon.com forward slash powerful ladies. We can get access to exclusive content that we're making just for you. Follow us on Instagram at powerful ladies and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube page. And of course, visit our website, thepowerfulladies.com for all the latest news, details, and updates. I'd like to thank our producer and audio engineer, Jordan Duffy. Without her, this wouldn't be possible. You can follow her on Instagram at Jordan K. Duffy. 
Thank you all so much for listening. We'll be back next week with a brand new episode. Until then, I hope you're taking on being powerful in your life. Go be awesome and up to something you love. This episode of The Powerful Ladies is made possible by our Patreon subscribers. Did you know that for as little as $1 a month, you can support this podcast? You can send us love, tell us that you want more. You can support all of our events and all that we're doing in the world to fulfill on our full circle of empowerment. It starts at $1 a month. That's less than the coffee you're drinking a day. And there's so many more levels that give you more bonuses and fun things and behind the scenes information. So go to our Patreon, patreon.com slash powerful ladies and support us today. Thank you in advance. <laughs>